In the late 70s, a merciless serial killer began to strike in New York and New Jersey. It was a very big story because of how gruesome it was. His methods, heinous and extreme. These were very bizarre and bloody crimes. Beheaded, burnt, chopped up. He killed with callous confidence. Some narcissists absolutely believe they are invisible, they're untouchable. It was the second case of a woman's body being found on the premises of this motel. But who was this serial sadist? What sick son of a bitch would do something like this? And was he born to kill? In 1977, New Jersey detective Alan Greco was about to be confronted by a mystery. We received a call that a young married woman was reported missing from her apartment complex in Little Ferry, New Jersey, under suspicious circumstances. Mary Ann was an x-ray technician who had uh, been married a short period of time. They lived in a garden apartment. There were very strange circumstances in that uh, uh, the report came from her husband who was away on a business trip. Mary Ann had failed to keep an appointment that evening with her mother-in-law. Concerned, Mary Ann's husband had called the police. There did not appear to be anything broken in the apartment, no broken uh, glasses, no forced entry on the door. And we had no indication at all as to what had happened to Mary Ann Carr. Despite her husband's apparent absence, there had been a suspicious sighting at the time of Mary Ann's disappearance. We had a witness who uh, lived in the same apartment building who said that as he was backing his car out of the uh, parking lot, he saw a person in his rear view mirror that he thought was Mary Ann Carr's husband. Although they didn't know it at the time, Mary Ann's husband bore a likeness to a former resident of the Little Ferry Apartments. A successful New York computer operator, Richard Francis Cottingham. He worked in what they refer to as Midtown Manhattan, right in the heart of the uh, business district, the Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is a very substantial insurance company. Fellow computer operator Dominic Volpe worked with Cottingham for 13 years. I and Richard worked on the console together, chatting a lot. He was well read and he was uh, up to date on current events. He, was, uh, he read a lot of stuff about medicine. He was pretty smart. At the time, a console operator was a big thing. It took four floors of a complete square block of a city for 17 megs of memory, OK? No one ever heard of a gigabyte then, but it was the cutting edge at the time. The thing that I noticed most about him is he couldn't sit still. He was always, uh, I called him the leg shaker. He was always sitting in his office chair, shaking, his legs were shaking, his back was shaking. And he would, he would keep that up for the, a whole shift for eight, nine hours straight. Across the river in New Jersey, investigating the disappearance of X-ray technician Marianne Carr, Detective Greco was called to a motel near the airport in the parking lot, a body had been discovered. She was clothed in a white nurse's uniform.
Marianne Carr was no longer a missing person, but now the victim of a homicide. We could observe Mary Ann Carr's body lying in this area between the curb and the fence. Mary Ann Carr's body uh, had uh, ligature marks on the uh, wrists and the ankles from handcuffs. So we know that uh, we knew that handcuffs were used in Mary Ann Carr's murder and she had a ligature mark along the aspect of her neck. Investigators speculated Marianne had been dumped from the trunk of a car, but had no solid leads. We had no idea of how she had gotten to where she was found, nor why she was there, nor who would have been responsible for removing her from her apartment and taking her there. However, it wouldn't be the last time they would be called to that location. A tale of terror and torture had only just begun. In December of 1977, the body of married X-ray technician Marianne Carr had been discovered dumped in the parking lot of a New Jersey motel. With no real leads, Detective Alan Grieco was facing frustration as the investigation began grinding to a standstill. You need to have the investigation lead you in a particular direction. Without that direction, it's like a shotgun blast, that you're covering all of these uh, different things that 99% of them have no connection whatsoever. While Marianne Carr's case stalled, police were kept busy by a series of violent attacks in the airport area. There were actually a number of incidents of sexual assaults that had taken place within that time period in which victims were either found on the side of the roadway or reported to be in motel rooms, semi-conscious. The attacks were perpetrated on prostitutes that had been picked up in New York City, where New Jersey resident Richard Cottingham worked as a computer operator. It was strange. I mean, most of the stuff we talked about, other than the job uh, at the time, was stuff that he uh, he did after work, supposedly. You know, he talked about S and M clubs he'd go to. He talked about prostitutes. Cottingham made no secret of his enjoyment of New York's dark entertainments. New York City at that time was a very different place than it is now. The Times Square uh, area was a set virtual cesspool. Porno houses uh, up and down the block. Street walkers uh, for blocks around. Photojournalist Alan Tannenbaum captured the prostitution industry at the time whilst working for the Soho News. It was rampant. It was all over the place but especially concentrated in the few blocks around here. It was quite funky, very seedy. I can, I can give you an example right around the corner. We got three strippers right here. Hey, oh, yes. Strip together, you stick together. Everybody loves a stripper. Come on in. All right. The girls would work on these corners by the uh, subway entrances, in doorways, close to the peep shows, and solicit asking uh, men uh, going out, on a date, and or, or the men would approach them. It was pretty obvious who was a working girl. Eighth Avenue was one of the more uh, seedy parts of this strip. In fact, it used to be called the Minnesota Strip. Uh, that's because girls would uh, come to New York City from the Midwest get off at the Port Authority and they would immediately 
uh, get hustled by pimps who would put them into prostitution. I think a lot of them were, were, were runaways and a bit naive and probably not arriving with a lot of money so that they would get trapped into this kind of situation. Now, these young women were being plucked from the city streets and brutally assaulted. Prostitutes are very, very common victims. Why? The hardest thing in getting a victim is the abduction. How do you get a woman to go with you? Um, you have to talk to her, and even if you could talk well and you're somewhat articulate and charming and engaging, not all women are going to go with a stranger. The problem with the abduction is eliminated by targeting prostitutes. That's part of their job description, to go with strangers, take their clothes off, uh, and have sex. The victims were being drugged, beaten, and dumped in an area just across the river in New Jersey not far from where the body of X-ray technician Marianne Carr had been found. There's a lot of motels in the area, and they're not high-class motels. They're uh, places that are used for uh, hour traffic, much of it from New York City. One of the patrons of those motels was computer operator Richard Cottingham. He used to talk about uh, how he would be able to lure a prostitute out of Manhattan, showing them. He always had two pockets full of cash, and tons of cash, thousands of dollars. He would show a prostitute the cash, and he would take them to New Jersey. But Cottingham, it seemed, didn't like the idea of paying for his pleasure. He talked about not letting anybody uh, get the best of him. One time, we had a long discussion about this hotel that he went to and how he could slip out of the place, you know, when she was asleep and take her, he said he took her clothes and her money and left her in the room. You know, when you're at work and you're talking, some of it you believe, some of it you don't believe. You take, you take you know, it goes in one ear and out the other. You take it with a grain of salt. Meanwhile, the attacks on the New York working girls continued, dumped, discarded, and left for dead. One of the girls was left in this motel on the corner here called the Airport Motel. She had been picked up. She was brought to a bar in New York City called Flanagan's, and that's the last thing she could recall. Near a major hospital, Flanagan's Bar was a popular haunt for Richard Cottingham. An analysis of her blood and urine uh, indicated that she was drugged. The young victim had been subjected to a horrifically violent ordeal. When she was found, she was unconscious in the room. And uh, she was in pretty bad shape. He sodomized her. Um, he beat her. Um, very, very severely, bit her breasts very uh, severely. Prostitutes are sexual service providers, and that offends many serial sexual murderers. As ironic as it sounds, many serial sexual murderers view themselves as highly moralistic, and they want to degrade prostitutes who are behaving in what they consider to be um, an unpermissible sexual conduct. They're very, very mixed up sexually. And so you would think that they would understand prostitutes and relate to them and understand, but they don't. They have very, very twisted sense of sexuality. In December 1979, someone would strike out against prostitutes in a way that would send shockwaves through the city. It was a very big story, even for Manhattan. It was very big. I clearly remember it because, if only because, of how gruesome it was. Emergency services had been alerted to a fire in a room at the Travel Inn Motor Lodge near Times Square. There they found 23-year-old Dee Dee Gudazi and another unidentified young woman. They were two alleged prostitutes that were discovered in beds in a motel room, and the bodies had been desecrated. 
Each woman's head and hands had been cut off before the beds were ignited. Beheaded, burnt, chopped up, and nobody knew who was responsible. It was a mystery. The dreadful nature of the crime led to the mystery perpetrator being dubbed the Times Square Ripper. And news soon hit the Manhattan computer room where Dominic Volpe and Richard Cottingham worked. This guy, his name was Rob, he came in, he said, what sick son of a bitch would do something like this? Take the heads and the hands off a girl and burn them in, all right? So I looked at Cottingham and he shook his head like this. He said, well, Rob, it could have been you, could have been me. I thought, he was, I thought it was a joke. The depraved crime appeared to have no connection to the murder two and a half years earlier of X-ray technician Marianne Carr, her body found in the parking lot of a New Jersey motel. It did not seem to have any connection to our case. Uh, it happened in New York City. Uh, with the bodies being desecrated the way they were. New York City had a tremendous amount of homicides every day, so there was no direct connection made at that time. This is an important point because we found in our research that about 70% of serial sexual murderers will experiment at a crime scene and do something very, very different with one victim that they had not done with the other, such as cut their eyes out, cut their vagina out, and so on. Now, when an investigator without extensive experience in this field looks at that, one victim looks so very different they're led to believe, at least from their own experience, that it has to be someone else. That's incorrect. However, detectives were about to be called to a scene with a similarity that couldn't be ignored. At the same location that Mary Ann Carr had been found two and a half years earlier, a chilling discovery had been made. A chambermaid was cleaning the room and uh, thought she detected what was a foul odor coming from the bed area. Lifting the mattress from the frame, she was startled to see the uh, naked, handcuffed body of a female, deceased female, lying there. It was extremely frightening and disturbing to the chambermaid, to say the least. Of that woman who we uh, sometime later uh, learned was Valerie Ann Street, who had been a prostitute in New York City. On her lower back, there was an abrasion, uh, which had been made by a sharp object. Uh, we thought at the time it was a knife. That was torture marks. It's eroticized the power and control that the offender has over the victim to make the victim realize that he, the offender, is in control of life and death. And so very often the offender will prolong her agony to kill her in a very, very slow and deliberate way so that she's aware that he's going to kill her. A monster was on the loose and it was clear he wasn't afraid to return to the scene of his crimes. That was the second case of a woman's body being found on the premises of this particular motel. I think that the fact that he'd use the same hotel is narcissism, and that brings us to the concept of narcissistic immunity. Some narcissists absolutely believe they are invisible, they're untouchable, they're so superior to everybody else that there's no chance that they're ever gonna get caught. As if to prove the killer right, identifying a suspect was proving impossible. We had no idea who the perpetrator of the murder of Valerie Ann Street was. In just a matter of days, the Times Square Ripper would strike again across the river in New York. During May 1980, two and a half years after the murder of X-ray technician Marianne Carr, 
a New Jersey motel had become the scene of a second brutal killing with the discovery of prostitute Valerie Ann Street. Meanwhile, in the computer room of a large New York insurance firm, Dominic Volpe would listen in disbelief to fellow operator and family man Richard Cottingham as he openly discussed his desires for the city's dark entertainments. He was very upfront about it. He bragged about prostitutes, s and gambling, all those vices that he had, he bragged about. Cottingham claimed to be a regular visitor to sadomasochistic clubs. He would describe things that went on there. He talked about a woman that was, was walking around with a guy on a leash. He was on his knees. He would walk into the bathroom. Cottingham would follow him and watch this. The girl made him lick the urinals with his tongue. He liked the slave thing, you know, handcuffs and treating people, you know, that, are, that had no way of helping themselves. It seems from an early age, Richard Cottingham had liked being in control. Back in Pascack Valley, New Jersey, Richard Newman was on the same high school track team. I met Richard on the athletic field. Richard stood apart in the sense that he wasn't always at practice, as I remember. He um, wasn't a joiner. He didn't have a nickname. He wasn't part of our little clique. He had a kind of wise guy attitude about him, dismissive of teachers and of school in general. I don't think he was crazy about authority. He would stand out from groups. It's common for narcissists who believe they're better than others. And it, obviously, they're at heart insecure. But he just has disdain for what other people are doing and doesn't really want to be invested in it. He thinks he's superior to everybody else. He was kind of a big guy, several inches taller than me, I'm sure, broad shoulders. I don't remember him menacing students in general. I do remember that the two or three friends of his, that he seemed to lord it over them a bit, like he was the leader of the pack, so to speak. He was certainly attracted to women, but my recollection is that he did not have a girlfriend. When he spoke about women, it was kind of in a negative way. Being in the locker room reminds you of the expression locker room talk. I certainly remember him talking among his friends and perhaps in gym class, if I remember, about what girls were attractive to him. And the only inkling you would have of the way his mind works is that he would talk about um, the girls in class or I guess the girls out on the street too who were perhaps uh, were better endowed, uh, you know, larger breasted. That just seemed to be sort of a key attraction for him. It's one thing to have an interest in large-breasted women because you think they're attractive. It's another to have an obsession with the breasts, not the women, the breasts. And that then becomes what we call a paraphilia or an abnormal um, sexual interest that is needed for arousal. Now in his mid-30s, Richard Cottingham would brag to his co-workers about his use of prostitutes. But it seems Cottingham didn't enjoy all aspects of the vice trade. I heard one conversation about he had a venereal disease that he contracted through a prostitute. And at that point, he was, he was, he was lot, he sounded angry when he mentioned the, the hookers. Less than two weeks after the discovery of the second body at the New Jersey motel, the Times Square Ripper struck again in New York. In a burning hotel bedroom, the body of another young working girl was found. Both breasts had been sliced off and taken away. 
In almost all serial sexual murder cases, they will go above and beyond killing the individual and engage in post-mortem activity that to them is sexually gratifying. This type of ritualistic behavior grows out of the offender's fantasy life. And very often, as a series of murders occurs, the individual's behavior becomes much more elaborate. As the offender gains much more comfort in killing, the ritualistic behavior is apt to become more personalized and more embellished. With a depraved killer on the loose, police in New York and New Jersey were in a state of frustration. But then, one week later, the killer would make an uncharacteristic mistake and reveal himself for the first time. Yet again, the motel in New Jersey would be the focus. There was a great deal of excitement uh, when we got the call from the Hasbrokites Police Department, which said that they had just apprehended a suspect attempting to flee from the motel. The motel front desk was alerted to a disturbance in one of the rooms. They decided to send one of their representatives to make sure that the occupants were OK. It took several minutes for someone to be coaxed to the door. Verbally, she said, yes, everything is OK, but with her eyes, gave the impression that everything was not OK. The motel staff immediately called the police, and an officer was dispatched. And when he responded, he responded to that area of the motel towards the farthest corner where there was an entrance. A man was observed running out of the building in a suspicious manner, carrying a bag in his hand. And at the time of his arrest, he had the handcuffs, tape used to either place over the mouths of the women or bind their hands or feet or what have you. So all of these items were incriminating, and he had no real explanation for it. The fleeing man was identified as Richard Francis Cottingham of Lodi, New Jersey. He had uh, a wife and children. He's a computer operator in New York City. He was in his mid-30s. He was kind of stocky. He was at, at least average looking, except again, as I say, he was kind of stocky. Well built, you might say. His wife. She described him, uh, to my recollection, as a devoted husband. Uh, she said that he was very attentive uh, to his children. Despite being virtually caught in the act, Richard Cottingham professed his innocence. He just flat out denied it. And I, you know, I found it very difficult to accept. They sort of caught him red-handed, as one might say. He was somewhat smug in his uh, attitude and his answers, although at one point he indicated the only thing I'll say is that I have a problem with women. Investigators immediately moved to search Cottingham's New Jersey home. We prepared a search warrant to look for any evidence that might be associated with female abduction, rape, murder. This is the street that Richard Cottingham lived on. Cottingham resided with his wife and children in a two-family home in a pleasant suburban setting. There's a middle-class neighborhood I would describe it as, uh, working-class people. Nothing would stand out of the ordinary. He seemed to be a normal dad and husband. It's what we didn't know was hidden underneath. He truly was a monster. Inside the family home, detectives would discover evidence of a man who reveled in sadistic murder. In the lower basement of his home, he had a large room, which was locked, which his wife or his children did not have access to. Now, this guy married with three children, but he has in this room, I suppose one could refer to them as souvenirs or memorabilia or whatever you want to call it, items that he took from these women after he tortured them and, and murdered them. 
people that we call organized serial killers often take trophies. They will take something from victims, uh, like an earring or a shoe or a piece of clothing, a purse. They're like big game hunters. The trophy room helps them to relive those moments where they felt most in control. The trophy room is a nice metaphor for this compartmentalized life. This is the place where they go to just completely fully indulge in their narcissistic fantasies of what they've done to other people. Now the successful computer operator, husband and father was identified as the Times Square Ripper and murderer of the women at the New Jersey Motel. His capture stunned those that had known him. It worked, it was like, it was unbelievable. No one talked about anything else. You hear Tony even got arrested and blah, blah, blah. And it was art and articles in the newspaper being copied every day. He talked about crazy things, but we never thought he would do crazy things. You know, I got chills on my arm just thinking about it now, 35 years later. So, so I mean, it was a complete shock. Amongst his co-workers, Cottingham had never made any secret of his vices of prostitution, sadomasochism, and gambling. He was a gambler. Uh, he was not afraid to take chances on anything. He usually won, I would say, 95% of the time he was a winner. He always said that he can get out of anything. There was nothing to take him over. In other words, he would always win. He used that gambling thing in his head for everything that he did. He was a winner. Now Richard Cottingham was about to gamble on being able to outwit his accusers and beat the legal system during his trial. He seemed to be a uh, very conscious participant uh, along with his attorney, taking notes, paying very close attention to the testimony of the victims and of the witnesses against him. You could sense that he was calculating all the time. I came to the conclusion that he was um, devious at best. After several weeks in court, everybody, of course, the, the jury, the judge, court officers, everybody sort of had the same impression. Mr. Cottingham was a very intelligent man. He was not as intelligent as he thought he was. He thought he was more intelligent than everybody else. That was, that was part of his personality. Cottingham denied all the crimes and claimed that on the one occasion that he had been caught at the motel with prostitute Leslie Ann O'Dell, the activities had been consenting. What's more, despite the advice of his lawyers, Cottingham insisted he wanted to personally take the stand. That was explained to him. You're going to be cross-examined. And uh, there are a lot of holes in your story that probably will be exposed. But he, he wanted to testify. A guy like Cunningham enjoys being smarter than other people, particularly the law enforcement. He thinks he's the smartest person in the room, no matter where he is. He wants to show everyone his brilliance and how smart he is. I started my cross-examination by getting him to admit the things that he could not deny, as any good prosecutor would do. He could not deny that he was arrested with multiple pairs of handcuffs. Handcuffs were used in the murders of Valerie Ann Street and Mary Ann Carr. They were used in the assault on Leslie Ann O'Dell. He could not deny that he had mouth suppressants. He could not deny that he had a knife, and a knife was used against Valerie Ann Street to torture her on the lower back. could not deny that. He could not deny that he had the barbiturate pills in his satchel. Barbiturates were used on one of the uh, victims that he had uh, sexually assaulted and thrown on the roadside. He could not deny that he bit Leslie Ann O'Dell's breasts. He could not deny it because it was in the photographs, part of the assault on Valerie Ann Street. On the stand, Cottingham was forced to admit that he had a fascination with bondage but as the pressure intensified, no one could have predicted the extent to which he would go to avoid imprisonment. A 
After taking the stand in his own defense for multiple assaults and murders, New York computer operator Richard Cottingham was faced with intense cross-examination. Under increasing pressure, the defendant had revealed a fascination with bondage since his childhood. From everything that uh, we were able to piece together, he had a typical upbringing, a middle class, lower middle class family, very close to his mother. Cottingham had been born in New York's Bronx neighborhood before moving with his family to the leafy Pascack Valley in New Jersey. His home was about two miles from where I uh, lived. It was a great area to grow up in. There was plenty of parks and open space. Yeah, this is it here. This is where he lived. A modest home set back from the road. Um, I didn't go in the house, but, um, but I remember that this is where he lived. I know his mother was devoted to him. These individuals are in very dark and perverse, sexually sadistic fantasies from very, very early on. The fantasy-driven crimes, like serial sexual murder, begins 10, 15, 20 years earlier in the offender's mind. Cottingham would claim that his deviant desires had grown out of the use of pornography. It's a common trajectory with sadistic sexual serial murders is to begin with ordinary pornography, even just erotic literature, even just catalogs that show women in underwear. Some people stop at various stages because they don't really like the rest. They, they're fine with the tame stuff. Others want more, and if that is what appeals to them and excites them and arouses them, they will continue to get more and more extreme with it. Not all serial killers are sadistic sexual murderers. Those who are tend to become very extreme with what they do to their victims. A portrait developed of a monster with a devious method of operation. He would go out on the street, meet these girls, say to them, I want to take you out, not just to have sex in the car or some such thing, but I'd like to take you to a restaurant. I just won a lot of money uh, in a card game or gambling. And he would show them a wad of money with a $100 bill around it. And of course, I guess these girls were impressed. They would go to dinner with him, and at some point, he would drug them. And then he was able to lead them out of the place into his car and take them to a motel and sexually assault them, plus cut them and try to torture them. That's the kind of person he is. As the evidence mounted, Cottingham faced the prospect of spending the rest of his life in prison. Still, by hook or by crook, the killer was determined to avoid incarceration. I had briefly left the courtroom and gone downstairs to my office. And as I came back into the courtroom, I immediately saw the matron in a, a frenzy running from the area of the holding cell, and without her saying a word, I knew that he escaped. During a break in proceedings, Cottingham had decided to make an audacious bid for freedom. Took a jacket and threw it uh, against the sheriff's officer's face. He followed the sheriff's officer and went about uh, one of the back stairways. I could see him running from the courthouse across the street. We chased him uh, across the street. A, another sheriff's officer had spotted him as well, and we both tackled him on the street and uh, put him in handcuffs and restrained him and brought him back to the courthouse. Richard Cottingham would not elude authorities again. He was found guilty and condemned to spend the rest of his life in prison. But was this serial sadist mad, bad, or born to kill? What makes them think they're going to get away with it? That's what I dwell on more than anything else. What makes them think they can continue to do it and have this smug attitude and exercise this this awful power over people. There's lots of things inside our 
mentality inside our personality that tell us not to do it. If only that that's a fellow human being and that they have loved ones at home. Those who are psychopathic absolutely have no remorse for what they're doing. They don't really care about people being in pain. Unless they're a sadist, then they care because they want them to be in pain. Um, so they're, a psychopath and a sadist are not one and the same, but if you get the two in combination, you have a very, very dangerous person. Some people might have uh, trophies for uh, their exploits in baseball or basketball or golf. Um, or awards that they get for community service. These were his trophies. These were his conquests. These were uh, his criminal activities, which he had gotten away with. And these were his trophies of how intelligent he was, uh, how charming he was, and how smarter than everyone else he was. Cunningham is pretty much a very classic serial sexual murderer. The best way to understand serial sexual murder is to view it as a deviant sexual arousal pattern where sex and aggression become fused and the aggressive act itself is eroticized, whether it's choking or cutting or stabbing. In regular sexual intercourse in normal conditions, there is some level of pain inflicted and received, and there's some level of biting and these sorts of things. In serial sexual murder, those particular behaviors are exaggerated enormously and really take a life on of their own. I think there is something in their genetic makeup. I think it is a twisted mind that associates sex with harm, hurt, injury and death. I think uh, someone who's a psychopath already starts at a disadvantage. Um, as he then gets exposed to things that lure him into wanting power over other people and in particular being a sadistic type of person, um, the, the idea of being born to kill comes pretty close to him. In 2010, the incarcerated Cottingham admitted to the murder by strangling of 29-year-old mother of two, Nancy Vogel, in 1967, when he was just 20 years old. And Cottingham is suspected of several other possible slayings. One thing is for certain, for those that met him and were lucky enough to survive, Richard Cottingham, torturer, murderer, mutilator, will never be forgotten. He was far different than people that I've met, and I've met some people from all kinds of bad backgrounds or bad situations. But he, I think, is intrinsically evil. You know, you fool around with hookers, you fool around with nurses, you fool around with this, you fool around with that, fine. A lot of people do that. Nobody kills people, nobody decapitates people, nobody rips people's hands off. I think he's a sick son of a bitch.